All right, we will go ahead and get started this morning. So this morning, I'm guessing most of you are here because you're tired of deeply technical sessions and you're trying to get to something that's a little bit more fun. Or maybe you've gotten to the point where you're like, these presenters are having an amazing time. I should get up on stage with them, you know, figure out how to do that. Um, or maybe you've realized that you just have a really crappy job because you don't get to play around with all the cool toys that you've seen all week. Um, or you're getting ready. I know three people who are giving their notice when they get back to their offices. They planned their job move around the summit. They're like, well, the company finally paid for training, and as soon as I get back to the office, I'm out of there. <sighs> Feel sorry for the next person. Uh, I should have the note, please silence your cell phones, yada, yada. People who are listening to the recording, they don't care about this anyway, we're gonna blow past that. Pass has all kinds of cool stuff, it's free, you can help give stuff away too, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, session evaluations, this is more for the other sessions that you've sat through throughout the course of the week. The most valuable thing for presenters is to see the comments. The ratings are cool, that helps pass decide who they're gonna invite back and who they're gonna send you know, off the island. But the presenters really wanna hear your comments on what they can do better. So the more specific you can be, like don't wear that ugly shirt, you know, get a haircut, whatever. About myself, my name's Brent Ozar. I uh, co-founded Brent Ozar Unlimited with a few of my really close friends. And normally you go on and on about your details in the about me slide. I'm actually gonna skip that because you probably either know who I am based on you just being here in the session or you're gonna figure out who I am through the course of the session. This is a little bit more challenging than most professional development settings or sessions. This isn't about, hey, learn to network, shake hands with your friends, go meet people because that just doesn't work for people like us. You may be looking back at who you talked to over the course of the summit. Did you really make that many new meaningful connections? A great friend of mine, Andy Warren, likes to say that he, his goal is to just meet three new people a day when he's at a conference like this, just three new people a day. And it's hard if you think about how far you have to go outside of your comfort zone in order to pull things off. This session is going to say my name a lot as we talk through things like blogging and webcasting and presenting. I'm not selling anything. I'm never going to have a book on how this stuff works. I give this away because I have been in your shoes. I still vividly remember the first past summit that I ever went to, and I tried to meet people. I tried to go out and talk to people I am not an extrovert. I don't like you people. I don't like anyone. It's easy to be funny and friendly up on a stage, but when you have to be up in person with somebody, like they're judging you and all that, that's much harder. So it's easy to be a goofball up here. The summit back in 2007, I was out trying to find, meet people. Hey, would you maybe like to go out to dinner with me? Maybe people are like, are you like trying to date me or something? No, I just, I'm trying to find other people who do the database thing. And so I was really intimidated when I didn't have a personal relationship with the presenters and I wouldn't go ask them questions directly. This session is about a lot of really personal stuff like careers and blogging and what your, your goals are for finance, things like that. So I don't want you to think you have to raise your hand to ask a question. If you want to, you can, but you can also go to brentozar.com slash go slash ask. This is a Google form that I have up here on my iPad, so I will see the questions that you ask on there. Don't worry about your neighbor sitting right next to you, seeing you type in a question and then you hit go and I immediately answer it up here. He won't connect it with you. He thinks you're checking your email, surfing the web, looking at dice.com. So it's the only time that URL is gonna be up on the slide, but all through the session, I've got that URL up here so I can just watch stuff as it comes in. I'll look down every minute or two. This presentation is also for me, circa 2004. This is a picture of myself. I was working in Dallas, Texas. I lived in Houston and I would drive up to Dallas a couple times a month and that was my little corner, corner cubicle slash office. And I managed a team of four or five people I was having the time of my life because I, I really loved my job, but I was pretty sure I couldn't get another job. I didn't have a good personal network. I didn't know who I would go talk to. And I was working for a struggling.com, and I mean really struggling. 
My wife and I, she was my girlfriend at the time, were building a house together. How many of you have ever uh, bought a house before? Just like signed on a mortgage and all that. You know the incredible stress that comes with getting closer to that mortgage date and how do you get all the paperwork absolutely perfect? It was even worse for us because we were building a house as part of a new subdivision. And leading up to it, I visited that house and the framing that was going up every single week. Erica and I would walk around through there. We wrote our names on the studs like Brent loves Erica because we wanted to have the memory of looking at a wall and going, our names are behind that. It had deep personal connections. And the week that I was going to go fill out all the mortgage paperwork, I'm getting ready to have an appointment with the mortgage guys and I'm supposed to bring in all of my documentation. My company has an all hands on deck meeting. And they said, I'm sorry, but we can't pay you this paycheck. And I'm like, okay, this is, that's bad, but I'm more, much more worried about the mortgage company asking for my recent checks and seeing that I work for a company that may not be able to pay me. I'm looking at that framed house, my name on the studs. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so screwed. And I wasn't doing well financially. I was just barely making by in order to save up like crazy to get this house. We couldn't even get the carpet that we wanted because it was too much in terms of an option cost. Berber, oh, what I wouldn't give to have had Berber. So I remember going into the mortgage office with my prior three checks and telling the mortgage banker, oh yeah, I just haven't gotten my most recent pay stubs yet. Uh, if you need them, I can go back and get them. Just, and I'm hoping and praying and just sweating bullets that they don't ask for that check. I got really lucky and I got approved, but I swore on that day, the day that I walked out of the mortgage office, I was never going to let that happen to me again and I was never going to be part of a company that would do that. I would never not pay someone's check, and I wanted enough control over my life that if I wanted to go do something stupid, I could, but I wouldn't have to have that much reliance and faith on other people. This was a really long, hard journey for me, and I made a lot of really stupid mistakes along the way because I didn't know anybody who had a map. And over the course of several years, I learned from other people and saw other maps that have been written up. I don't want you doing all of this work in a meandering, rambling fashion. I want to give you the shortest, easiest shortcuts that you can take in order to have people pay you as much as possible and as quickly as possible. I wrote blogs about anything, red-eared slider turtles. One of my favorite blog posts is about how you can use women's pantyhose as part of a turtle aquarium filter. You put gravel inside the pantyhose, you can save some money as opposed to buying nice expensive filters. And people go back and read that now and they're like, ha, 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 Brent used to blog about pantyhose. Now, I gradually started learning to write white papers and record webcasts and I'm like, oh my God, vendors actually will let you do this. Vendors will promote you if you want. And then eventually I stumbled into enough side work that I was able to start consulting. This was like a snowball that I put together more and more over time, more and more people knew who I was. And from zero, so having no job offers, struggling, sweating bullets, trying to figure out where I was gonna pay my next or how I was gonna pay things like the mortgage. Now I'm at the point where I get unsolicited job offers and enough of which that I can afford to hire other people and give them good jobs too. This is, I'm not trying to hire you. Ha <laughs> there's one of them, Richie, in the back. And your other two coworkers are up here in the front. I'm not saying you're lazy or late. I'm just saying everyone else got here before you did. This will be in your review. Um, so, and I actually told my, the staff, so like Richie, Tara, Eric, I'm like, do you, what are you here in this session for? Why do you want to get a better job? What are you trying to tell me here? What's going on here? So going from zero to unsolicited job offers took about 10 years. That blows. You don't think about what your age is now. 10 years from now, you're going to start getting unsolicited job offers. Ain't nobody got time for that. This session is really about two phases. In the first phase, you're building an online reputation so that when someone Googles you, you're in control of what they see. 
Googling for someone is the standard approach now when you start going through interviews or you start going through the resume pile round. One of the first things that I'll do is it'll go Google somebody. And I'm not just looking for their website, I'm looking at the questions that they've asked and the questions that they've answered. I don't necessarily care if someone's presented in person before, that's hard, it takes a long time to get to that point. But if I see a series of really dumb questions that you probably could have figured out by just running an experiment yourself in the lab, I'm gonna know you're probably faking it. If I see you taking your company's code, your current employer's code, and pasting it on the web for everyone in the world to see and going, can you tell me why this doesn't work? Nope, not gonna happen. But if I see you proactively reaching out and answering other people's questions, especially since all the websites out these days have date times on them, so I can see when you answered questions at Stack, at SQL Server Central, at SQLteam.com, I can see the work and thought that people put into this stuff. That is an incredible edge over everyone else who's looking for a job. Now, when most of our clients are going out and trying to hire a DBA, they don't go randomly Googling names, but when the stack of resumes comes in, they are Googling through those names. That's what phase one is about. When someone runs a Google on you, what do they see? I used to think when I was blogging, no one's gonna read my stuff. Every, there's all these other good posts out there on all kinds of topics. It doesn't matter. When you go to a museum, when you go look at paintings on the wall, do you look at a flower and go, what the hey, another flower? Haven't we all painted flowers every way they can possibly be painted? Or hills with you know, plants on them? No, you go and you look at what that person's take on flowers is. Your blog or your presentations, your scripts, whatever, is your take on a topic. That's what's valuable, and it doesn't matter if anyone finds it in phase one. What matters is when someone Googles for you, what do they see? In phase two, it's gonna be about scaling this thing up so that people are finding your content and then throwing buckets of money at you. I'm all about that part. So in phase one, what we're gonna talk about is how to start your presence, what you wanna write about, why you wanna write about it, how you're going to write about it, how you're gonna build a learning plan and a project plan about how you're going to get there. My goal is, if you want to leave at the first break, you're going to have enough work that's gonna keep you busy through the next year. Then, if you want to stay, you can, we'll talk about taking your blog and your online presence and your consulting up even further, or you can go watch the recording later if you'd rather do that. I should give you enough homework by the first break that you're going to be terrified. So, first thing on there. Oh, I should look and check, just check to make sure if there's any questions. Are your employees really happy? No, that's not true, that's not a question. Um, so career success. What career success means to me, I wanna do things that scare me. I wanna do things that challenge me, things that are hard for me. If I'm doing the same thing over and over, if I see the same exact thing every day, I get frustrated. I wanna see new SQL servers every day. I wanna start to solve new problems every day when I go out and uh, tackle things. When I say challenging work that I love, I happen to love SQL Server. It took me a long time to find this part of my career, but I'm like, no, 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 this is all I want here. This is what's important to me. Screw management, screw like architecture, business intelligence, any of those other things. I just wanna work with people who are doing challenging work that we love. I wanna be surrounded by people I admire. Not just that I like, because I like a lot of people who I'm like, yeah, you're not really all that impressive. I want to work around people that I admire, people who are smart, who do terrifying things. You know, stuff that I'm like, whoa, how did you come up with that? That's amazing. Don't get a big head. It's just, you, you, were the, you weren't my first choices, but you know, I have to live with that. Um, I want to work for a company that I respect. It doesn't matter that necessarily that my goals line up for theirs, but I don't want them doing slimy things. I don't want them stabbing you know, people or citizens in the back. I want a fair trade between the hours that I put in and the reward that I get. 
There are times in my life where I want to work 50 hours or 60 hours a week, where I'm having a fantastic time, but I want that to be my choice, not my employer's choice. I don't want my employer saying, well, we got this deadline coming up. I need you to put in, you know, come in on Saturday and Sunday. We got a whole bunch of client stuff going on. I need you to work late at night. I want it to be presented to me as an option, and if I want it, I'll take it. Otherwise, there's times in my life where I want to go take off and go be, up, be by the beach, do whatever it is that I love. I don't want to wait until I'm like 70 in order to retire. I know my parents are old. They can't get around as well as they used to. I can't get around as well as I used to, and I want to be able to go out and have fun while I still can. I want the ability to make the trade-off choice that myself, I talked about that. But everything that I'm going to talk you through here, I'm not saying you need to own your own business. I'm not saying you need to be a consultant. I know full-time employees who are able to make these same kinds of choices. This isn't an employment pitch for our company because we're not hiring. And for those of you who follow our blog, you'll even know that I had to lay three people off a couple few months ago. That was incredibly painful. This is a good example of how anything that you guys want to ask this uh, today, I'm totally up for it, whatever that is. Career failure. This is what a crappy job looks like to me. I've had a lot of crappy jobs like this. One of my favorites was I went into a job. I'm one of the toughest interviewers you will ever meet. And I don't mean asking you questions. I mean asking the company questions. I ask really hard questions because I don't want to be miserable anymore. I went through that with not being able to pay my mortgage. Instead, I ask all kinds of tough questions about what the work is like, what my coworkers are like. So I take this job at a huge financial company. And I show up the first day. And they're like, well, we don't have a laptop for you. So you, you just may bring in your own laptop the first day, bring in an air card, you won't be able to plug into our network, but until we get you a, a laptop, you can go do whatever you want. That sounds like a good job at first. But I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna go get some coffee. Where's the coffee at? Oh, we don't have coffee here. If you want coffee, you need to go down 20 floors to Starbucks and you can go buy your own. Oh, okay, all right, okay, well, maybe well, one sign, maybe not everything. So I'm working and it comes lunchtime and there's no fridges, there's no microwaves. If you want any food, you actually have to have your own fridge or microwave at your desk so that you can go cook your own food or go outside in order to get food. One day my com computer finally comes and uh, I'm working on things and I'm you know, making progress with stuff. And I'm informed that as part of this company, I have to leave at a certain time. Doesn't matter if you're in the middle of troubleshooting a pro product or a, an issue or not, you have to leave at exactly five o'clock. Again, sounds like an awesome job, right? But it was because they'd had union type lawsuits over the past and if anyone worked over five o'clock, they would have to pay huge sums. I'm kind of anal retentive, like, well, I'm a database administrator. You guys know how that works. I'm kind of anal retentive and I want to fix the problem before I go, but I had to just leave it to someone else, which at first sounds cool until you realize at 8 a.m., guess what you're walking into? Everyone from the overnight shift, whenever their shift's finished, we couldn't have a handoff time. They dropped everything and I walked in cold to someone else's problems. One thing after another happens like this, and I go to my manager and I said, so tell me, what does success look like here? What does it look like to get a raise? You know, at the end of the year, I, I thought I'd understood that during the interview. And she said, here's the deal. I can only give raises to 10% of my staff. So I do it by seniority. Whoever's been here the longest without getting a raise, they get a raise that year. Oh. So that's not good. I mean, the salary was okay, but I didn't expect to go 10 years without getting a raise. That's not quite as good. So I said, man, are you sure about that? And she said, now let me tell you something. You've noticed that how every day you've come to work here, there's almost no one else in our cubicle farm. There was space for 20 DBAs, almost nobody was here. She goes, here's what the rest of the team does. They take their laptop with their air card and they leave, they telecommute. They don't show up back into the office again very often. And what they do is they get another job at another company. Every morning they open this other laptop, they do a few help desk tickets, and then they go on to their other job and they cash two checks. 
So I quit. I was like, no, 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 that's not how I roll. This isn't going to be how this happens. And I don't ever want to have a job like that again. That's what failure looks like to me. It's a pretty profitable failure, as long as you don't mind sleeping on pillows of money. Um, so when I'm going out to find a brand new job from scratch, success to me means not having to go to the classified ads, not having to talk to a recruiter, not having to go to Monster or careers.stackoverflow.com. Because the instant that you're in a pile of resumes, you're screwed. There's always someone with more experience than you, and there's always someone who's willing to work cheaper than you. There's always someone who can interview better than you. And there are people who will lie. They'll just lie on their resume. They'll do things like cash that two check situation. Anytime I'm in a stack of resumes, I am boned. It's just not going to happen. Success to me means someone just coming in and saying, hey, Brent, here's some work that I think you'd really be interested in. Would you like to take a look at that and talk to us about it? <laughs> yeah, especially if the better you are at branding and the more people know exactly who you are and what your style is and the kind of work that you like to do. When they have the, the past summit speaker orientation, one of the things that they tell you is every speaker needs to be business casual. You're not supposed to wear jeans. You're not supposed to wear t-shirts. You should be wearing a shirt with a collar and nice pants. You will notice I've never done that. I don't do that. My shirt with a collar is down here because I want people to understand who I am. This is the way I show up on site with clients. If you're looking for a guy in a suit, call another number. I am not that guy. I have one suit in the closet. I'm going to wear it when my wife dies. That's about the only time I'm going to wear it. Things when I ad lib and I'm like, that's going on a recording. My wife's surely going to watch that. It's not going to go well. You in a hurry to wear that suit? I can make that happen. Um, I suck at this because I suck at networking. I don't know how to go out and talk to people in person. Hi, my name is Brent. I like long walks in the park with slow databases and making them start to run instead of walk in the park. And so in order to figure out how you guys do on this, we're going to take a very short quiz. So answer each of these questions. And you don't have to track which points you scored on which question. Just track how many points you've scored so far. First question, when you go to meet new people, write down how many points that you've had there. Question two, your personal network. <laughs> token ring, also good for, that's zero points, really, if you're still using token ring. Question three, in order to get ready for your next job, what do you do? Next question, for your career growth, how much time do you set aside per week? And I know that for each of these, it can sound really crazy. Oh my God, who sets aside two days per week? There are lots of people who are bloggers, presenters, authors, consultants, who go off and learn new technologies all the time. I wish I had that kind of time. Last question, how do you get back to the community? then add up all your points. When you add up all your points and you're in the five to seven point range, there's something important to understand. No one is ever going to take care of you. Again, my wife is like, yeah, that's right, not after that suit comment. Now, no one is going to take care of your career. Everyone else is really working on their own careers. The best bosses I've ever had have spent like 15 minutes a week just helping me on my career. And I was like, oh my God, you're amazing. You people, you're fantastic. No one is looking out for you because they're all too stressed out about their own job. Think about how you've asked, have you talked to your boss to say, where is it that you're going on your career and how can I make you help? Or how can I help? 
You have to be in control of your own job. No one's going to take care of you. The raise fairy isn't going to come in and give you a 50% raise overnight. I know so many DBAs who think, I've been growing my skills for the last couple of years. Why won't they give me a 30% raise? Because this isn't Disneyland. This isn't how that happens. When you want things like a 30% raise, you have to do radical, tremendously different things. Companies want to pay you as little as possible for as long as they possibly can, and then beat the new guy with the whip as well. If you scored 14 to 20 points, you don't need this session. You're doing a spectacular job already. You're out there shaking babies and kissing hands. Richie gets up to leave. That's because you're unhirable. Um, I did. I needed this session in a desperate way. I look back at myself when I talk about 2004 Brent, and I had a horrible job hunting experience. When I went to go leave that company that abused me, I, had one, I say abused me, they were, they were just wonderful to me and I loved that boss, but they didn't have enough money and they had several instances where they didn't pay our paychecks. And I kind of looked at it as abuse because I'd like to get paid for the work that I do. They wouldn't let me sit on the bench for a week and not do anything. Sorry, I'm busy this week, Pokemon. Uh, so 2004 Brent's job hunt, I went out and started looking for new jobs. I'm like, all right, let's go see what I can find. And I happened to interview with a very prominent member of the SQL Server community. I didn't know about the community yet. I hadn't been to a summit yet. I didn't, there weren't such a thing as really SQL Server blogs that much back then. There was Brad McGeehee's SQL Server Performance was about the closest thing that we had. And so I go into this job interview and I thought I was front runner because it was the second interview that I had. I'd gotten past HR and now I was talking to the database administrator. I was talking to him over the phone. He said, all right, the first question I'm gonna ask you is, if you were gonna build a monitoring tool, what would you do? I said, I wouldn't, I'm a database administrator, right? You're hiring me for a DBA job, not a developer position, right? Nothing against developers, but I, I just don't have those skills. He said, no, but what if you were going to build one? I said, I, I wouldn't, I'd buy it. They're 1,500 bucks. You know, go buy Spotlight, SQL Century DM, or IDERA SQL DM, SQL Century Performance Advisor, whoever you want to buy. He said, no, you, you should be able to do this. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm clearly the wrong guy. I'll go ahead and save you the time and I'll leave. And he said, do you know about the community? Do you know about the SQL Server community and there's an open source monitoring tool out there? I said, but, no, who am I going to call when it breaks? No one's on call for this, and it's me who's on the hook if I do something wrong. He said, well, I wrote it. I said, how would I know who you are? I don't have your phone number if I was going to go call someone online. I did not get that job. And I even questioned why he was doing that for the SQL Server community. Today, these days, he and I are actually friends, and we laugh about that job interview. But I crashed and burned hard. If I would have known him personally, like talking to him at a conference, I would have recognized his name when I had the interview and gone, oh, it's him. I'm going to go Google and look at the tools that he's built and figure out how I can build a rapport. I didn't get that job. I didn't get all kinds of jobs. I got really lucky with another kind of job. My job is to make SQL Server go faster. Today, I've really focused and honed things down. This is the only thing that I do. I don't go fix replication issues. I don't troubleshoot uh, why your cluster won't start. I just make SQL Server go faster. And so as a result of making SQL Server go faster, I measure stuff for a living. I can tell you all kinds of perfmon counters, all kinds of weight stats, which Q lengths are bogus, which Q lengths are interesting. I cannot believe I have gotten to the point in my career where I'm the guy who can name DMVs by heart. I've gotten to the point where I know the fields that are in them yet, but at least that's where autocomplete comes in. The sad part was, as much as I measure stuff, I had no idea how to measure my career. Absolutely no clue. I go around flailing around with all kinds of numbers. So many of us have Apple Watches or Fitbits, and we can tell you how many steps we took today, but we're not even measuring our careers. Well, I got 7,000 steps yesterday. That's awesome. Unless you're getting paid by the step, let's start talking about how you're going to get to retirement. Now, salespeople have two metrics. The first one is simply how much money they make 
They measure it a couple of different ways, how much they sell, plus what percentage of that comes through downline to them. They know very well how much money the company's making, what percentage of that they get to keep. And in order to do it, you guys have been through vendor booths this week. How many of you went through a vendor booth this week during the exhibit hall? And I bet during the course of that, you get grilled with a whole bunch of questions very quickly. Are you having this pain? Are you having that pain? Let me tell you how our, our software can solve that pain. How many servers do you have? When they ask you how many servers they have, they are running calculators in their head about whether or not they're gonna be able to make their Lexus payment next month if you sign that contract. It's a very simple set of formulas. The second metric for salespeople is how many people know them? How big is their network? And I really look at this as like a vanity thing, and they track it very carefully, like how many LinkedIn connections do I have, and how many business cards have I got in my Rolodex. I, I don't like that kind of thing, but I understand why they're doing it. Because any time that they get a new job selling stuff, they immediately need to pick up the phone and call everyone that they know. Hey, you having problems with SQL Server? Can I tell you, sell you, sell you something, and it'll help you fix that. I, ugh, that makes me cringe. I'm not the kind of person who's gonna go harvest stuff from all my friends. You people know if you use our stuff, we give you scripts out the wazoo. Go take it, make your job better, whatever. Old school networking is horrible for me. It's a time suck. I have to be at a certain place at a certain time. I don't get a choice on that time. I have to show up at the Chamber of Commerce at 6 p.m. and shake hands with a bunch of people that I will probably never meet again, and I have to explain what SQL Server is over and over. That's my idea of a really bad time. Even at home, my wife you know, will say, how was your day today? Did you have a good day at work today? And the instant that I start explaining something, she goes, a simple yes or no would have been fine. That's all I really need to hear. And I wish I was joking about that. I'm not. It doesn't scale. It's only a few people at a time. If you're really good, like I talked about Andy Warren, you can meet three different people each day. But if you run the numbers on that, how much it costs to be at Summit, because how many of us are independent consultants or consultants with another company? So this is all money coming out of our pockets to go to Summit. We have to get training and we have to meet other people in order to improve our network. But you can only meet a few people. And you know how it is when you're heading out the hotel, there's a trail of business cards flying behind you as you're trying to run to the airport and you may never talk to these people again. This isn't what we would call web scale. And a lot of us in here have Asperger's, right? A lot of us just aren't all that good relating to other people. I suck at that. I'm horrible with that kind of thing, but I'm really good at working numbers. If you give me an app, you give me a database, a program, I'm on it. Give me a formula that I can work on. So the first thing I'm gonna work on this in order to think like a salesperson is, where does my money come from? What do I get paid to do? And then second, how can I get known for doing that? Let's start with the first one. What do you get paid to do? And what could you get paid more to do? I'm gonna give you another quiz. In this one, you don't have to write any answers down. All you have to do is think through it. And for every question, it's gonna have the same six answers. I'm gonna give you a pain, a problem that a company is facing, and I want you to tell me, if you're the person in charge of fixing that pain, which of these six options are you gonna pick? Start with the first one. You're building a brand new SQL Server from scratch, and you wanna know things like how many TempDB files should I create? How large should they be? What should their auto growth settings be? To solve that, do you do number one, which is you just go Google it, read a few things, and go off to the races? Two, do you pay 50 bucks and go read a book about it? Three, do you pay 200 bucks and get a video class, spend hours of your life watching that video? Four, pay 3,000 bucks, go to a conference like the Pass Summit or a training class somewhere, spend a week of your life and then come back to it? Or six, pay 10 grand and hire someone who's done it? Think just to yourself for a second. Question number two. 
Your application that's already in production does all kinds of work in TempDB, and it's slow. You're getting all those 15-second I.O. warning errors on TempDB. Users are starting to complain. Now, in order to fix a SQL Server that's already in production, that's having these issues, what do you do? And then three, you've already tried that stuff. Say that you've spent a week, two weeks trying to fix the problems with TempDB. The SAN team is saying it's SQL Server. The SQL Server is saying it's the SAM team. Everybody's blaming the network, and the developers are happy because they're just off the hook for once. This is now stopping your business from selling products. The website is starting to be noticeably slower. People are abandoning their shopping carts. Now, which one of those do you pick? Let's try a slightly different series of questions. Let's take this one. You've decided that architecturally, you want to start offloading your read queries to a secondary server. You want to figure out which technology you should use. Is it going to be log shipping, always on availability groups, replication, or maybe build an ETL process? What am I going to do architecturally to go build this thing out? Do I just go Google it? Do I pay 50 bucks? Do I pay a couple hundred bucks? How much do I pay in order to make this architectural decision? Let's take it up a notch. You decided to use replication, but the replication to the report server keeps breaking. It gets out of sync, and we're having to reinitialize it because our reports show old data. So to troubleshoot that problem, how much money and time do you want to spend? And then finally, not only does replication keep breaking, but every time you try to reinitialize it, the primary server falls over. You're not allowed to take snapshots fast enough. You're not allowed to do full backups fast enough. And every time you try to reinitialize, it takes your primary website down as well. Now, how much are you going to spend in terms of money and time? Over those past two scenarios, there's a really clear pattern here, and it breaks down to this grid. Across the top is how bad the business's pain is, not the geeks, but are the business people starting to notice it? Because we don't have any money at all. Let's be honest. It's the business people who have all the money. And like you can tell because they wear the suits that are ugly. They buy them at, see, as soon as I start to say company, then immediately I'm like, oh, the DBA for that company is going to be in here. Someone other than your company. Um, then down the left-hand side, we have the urgency of it. Is it very urgent or not really all that urgent at all? Let's talk through each of these one by one, starting with pains that aren't very urgent and there's no business severity to them. These are examples of pains like that. Those pains are our pains. This is what we solve on a daily basis. What does this mean from SP Blitz? What does this 15 second IO warning mean? How do I configure TempDB? Things that we're just kind of curious about. You can solve those pains. We solve those pains. Panal Dawe, who's here at the, uh, uh, at the summit this year, solves these pains. This is where you build permanent material and give it away for free. You go out and write blog posts, you build presentations, and you put them out on the internet for anyone to find because no one is spending money on these. When I asked you how you would configure TempDB, sure, some of you probably sat in Gail Shaw's session like I did earlier this week to go see more information about TempDB. But if you were going to go build a brand new SQL Server from scratch, you don't go, hold on, Summit is coming up. I'm going to wait until after Summit, and then I'll come back and configure TempDB. No, of course not. You come here to learn kind of proactively, but when the gun is to your head that you've got to get the SQL Server set up as quickly as possible, you just go Google. And there's plenty of answers out there, many of which are wrong, most of which are on my site. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the next part of the grid. What happens when it's a very urgent problem 
but there's mild or no business pain. My restore is running and taking forever. I don't understand. What the hell am I supposed to get this to finish? I've got a temp DB that's filling up. I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, build a new server for next week. There's urgency, but it's coming from us. And it's not coming from the business, although the business is like, can you just take care of this as quickly as possible? When it's stuff like dev servers or you're building a new server in your lab, these problems are everywhere. If you go into Stack Exchange, uh, SQL Server Central, oh my God, this query is terrible. Can someone please fix it for me urgently? It's not like the business is under pain. That person is under pain because they're about to get fired because they're incompetent. And yes, I know that question was yours. I was trying to help you with that question on Stack. You can make money fixing these, but it means a long-time, full-time job. This is going to sound really weird to a lot of you, but there are people out there who love working support. I used to work for a big software vendor, and they actually had a help desk full of people who got excited every morning taking support calls with crazier and crazier things coming into them. Oh my God, I have, and this, I wish I was kidding, 17 instances on this one box. Can you help me figure out how to do affinity masking across each of those with your backup software? Oh, unsubscribe. I would be huddled under the desk with the wine that Alexander gave me. Alexander, see, this is how you know. Alexander, where are you? Where'd you go? Here he is up front. This is an example of a perfect attendee. I want all of you guys to take notes from this uh, for next year. Alexander brought me a bottle of wine from his vineyard. Mm -hmm. So you have two things you have to do next year. One is you have to get a vineyard. <laughs> two, you have to bring me some wine. Um, so you can get jobs solving these. You can also solve them for free. You can go over to SQL Team, SQL Server Central, and go solve these. But you need to understand that it's going to be like that for the rest of your life. Those people aren't going to pay you. I love answering questions at sites like dba.stackexchange because it's interesting when someone puts good work into their question and when I have some free time. But I know I'm never getting paid for that. That is not paying the rent. It's something I do just because it's fun. But next up, this one. Things that aren't urgent but have severe business pain, like our sand sucks. And we've decided now is the time we're going to go build a new SAN. We're not going to go jump into it. We're not going to try and do it in 24 hours. We're going to think through it. We're going to evaluate several SANs from several major vendors. Or we've decided that long-term reporting against production just doesn't work. I want to go build a data warehouse, architect it out. Finally here, in this scenario, there's actually some real money. As soon as we start talking about severe business pains, now there's actual checks, and these checks often have six digits or seven digits inside of them. You can get jobs doing this. It's typically with large consulting shops, hardware vendors, people who have 100,000 or million dollar deals on the line. They're gonna go deliver a new data warehouse. They're gonna go deliver a whole new piece of shared storage. It's generally not independent consultants or contractors who are involved in these kinds of projects. The reason why is the sales cycle is usually very long. When the business need isn't urgent, then the salespeople can afford to take all those executives out for golf matches, football games, steak places, any it is that they, anywhere it is that they want to go. You and I don't do that. Salespeople do that and they get paid in big, huge chunks whenever the deal closes. Companies will hire you full time to work on those projects. You're just not gonna be the person who closes the deal. And companies are looking for people who are great communicators. There's a whole new kind of genre of people out there in the world, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Adam Savage, Alton, Br Alton Brown, who are really good at explaining complex reactions, complex things in ways that the rest of us human beings find interesting and enjoyable. Consulting companies hire people like that because when they need someone to do technical pre-sales or technical evangelism, 
They want to grab someone who can talk to executives and developers and sysadmins and keep them all entertained without lying. These issues also pop up online. Someone will say, I need to build a new data warehouse. Can someone please give me a database structure? You're not getting paid for that. Anytime you see a public question that's on a non-urgent but severe business pain, all these people are doing is it's other consultants who are going, can you please solve this problem for me? Those of you who raised your hands and said you were consultants, I'm not talking about you because you invested in your career. You're here learning. But believe it or not, there are consultants out there who don't know anything, but they're amazing at building awesome resumes. And they work for $25 an hour because they can't find any other work. And so they come into the company and go, well, yes, I know SQL Server 2013. I have seven years of experience in that. Then the company hires them you know, for $25 an hour, and that consultant immediately turns around and has to start posting questions on Stack Exchange, Server Fault, whatever. There's no money in helping for that. If you ever see stuff out online where someone wants that kind of help, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I just don't want you to think there's a career at the end of that rainbow. I have all kinds of end of the rainbow jokes there. We're not going to make any of those. So let's talk about this one. Severe business pain and very urgent. Our SQL server keeps falling over. Every time we post a coupon code on Facebook, our website goes down. We just signed our biggest customer, and all of a sudden, our SQL server can't handle the load. These, the sales cycle is very short because it consists of an executive running around with a platinum Amex going, can someone just take this card and make the pain go away so we can sell stuff again? They don't ask questions about your background. They don't ask questions about your qualifications. They're just Googling and finding the first person with a really good reputation to solve this problem, depending on the company size. For large businesses, when a really large business has a problem with their SQL server going down, they don't call us. Unless, of course, there's someone here from Microsoft. Is anyone here from Microsoft in here? Yeah. Oh, well, there's a couple. See, they're looking for better jobs. I don't know what's going on there. There's not better jobs than Microsoft. Stop there where you're at. Go to another department. No, I have Microsoft. Is, I've, they've gotten so many community members lately. A whole bunch of community members have gone off and started working for Microsoft. And I hear such nice songs coming from inside. They're like, it's even better than it looks on the outside. Come on down. And I'm like, no, I never want a boss again. Screw you. Um, small businesses call other small businesses. And if you're an individual, like if you're a developer running a dot com, you call other individuals. Walmart is not calling me. You know, the largest companies in the world aren't calling me and dealing with, they have a huge legal team, they want a big monster contract. I don't want to go chasing those whales. Large companies relieve it by calling other large companies, which means if you want a stable job where you never have to sell anything and you want to fix urgent and different problems, you go to work for a big consulting company. Microsoft's a great example. Premier Field Engineers, Microsoft Support, CSS. They have armies of people who get to see different problems all the time, and they're all urgent problems. You don't have to build up a blog presence to go to work for shops like that, because they don't really care about your blog. You're not responsible for bringing in any traffic. You're not responsible for selling anything. Small to mid-sized companies, on the other hand, it's kind of different. They don't have a relationship with a big monster company. They don't have a Microsoft Premier Support Agreement, for example. And they don't have so many SQL servers that they need an army of consultants at their beck and call. Sometimes maybe they have one SQL server, or 10, or 100. And they may have one DBA, or maybe none, or maybe a couple, or if you're a BI person, an analytics person, analytics is a great example of this. All the small businesses out there, mine included, have problems that could be solved by analytics, but we can't afford to hire full-time analytics people. This is where independent consultants and small freelance firms start to come in. 
And I'm not pitching this as better than a large firm. Both of these are good. I'm just exploring out what your options are inside this small, uh, small uh, company deal. When you're facing problems with a very high severity, a very high urgency, that combination of business pain plus short sales cycle, this means that you can get in quickly, but this also means you are continuously selling. For example, at our company, we specialize in a three-day process, which means I need to close multiple contracts every week. I don't get to take an off week in terms of sales. Whereas if you work for a larger company with those slower sales cycles, they can just sign one big contract and then work gently with that same company over and over again. These same issues, the high business severity, super urgent, these also pop up online too. My database is corrupt and it won't come back online. They're gonna fire me if I don't fix this. Yes, that's true, but you are not getting paid to fix that. The reason why they're posting it online is they don't have a budget. They have to get this thing fixed as cheaply as possible, especially when it's that, it's SQL Server 7 and no one will answer my calls. Yes, there's a reason for that. So as I look back at this grid, you can make a living on half of these. You can make a living, living over on the right-hand side when it's severe business pain. You can make money on the left-hand side, but it's gonna take a lot longer. If you work on the left-hand side, you're really taking the long route. This is the route that I took, and I'm cool with that. The long route is you build a blog or build an online presence that constantly helps people so that when other people are searching for help, they'll find you and say, oh, you're an expert on performance tuning, R, PowerShell, whatever it is. And I know it's very easy to think, oh, it's all been blogged about. But this week here at PASS, I've talked to Microsoft, who some of their executives have said, we really wish we had a community that embraced PHP, Java, R, Python. We need blogs about how to make that stuff work with SQL Server. And those are wide open green fields for people to go attack. I am not attacking those, because about the only thing that I can do is spell most of those, especially R. The long route details on this, what you do is you go through, pick popular topics, TempDB, Perfmon counters, whatever, and you write blog posts about them. One or two blog posts a week. I was very disciplined to say, I'm gonna post a new blog post every Tuesday, let's say, across the span of a year. I rewarded myself after a year, then went for two years. It takes a long time, but you can build up your online reputation that way. Here's the shorter route. If you build up very quickly and very aggressively a good online presence so that people actually call you for specific jobs, you can pull these ones off on the right-hand side. To take that shorter route, what you want to do is think about what you want to hold in your hand one year from now. I'm going to show you through the course of the next hour what we're going to talk about for like an ebook or an all day presentation or a training class. What is it that you want to say? I have an ebook on R with SQL Server, for example. Then you write out the table of contents. What pieces am I going to need to build across the next year? And that becomes your calendar. I'm going to talk about also how much work it takes to do each piece of these. But when you're blogging over on the right-hand side, when you're trying to take that short-term route of getting to severe business pain, you have to be very aggressive in building things with a table of contents. You can't just blog about things that you want to talk about. No one's going to pay you for pantyhose-based red-eared slider uh, turtle filters in their aquarium. You have to aggressively go after a specific table of contents to build up a product that you want to have. Over on the left-hand side, you can be much more casual and just blog about whatever you feel like tackling this week. So before we go further, any questions on this particular grid? No. 
oh my goodness, you, so many of you are paying attention. This is fantastic. All right, so next, let's talk about our building plan. What are we gonna build across the span of the next week or the next several months? There's this concept of something called inbound marketing that I'm going to talk about, how you build people to come in to you, how you're going to get them to give you jobs. Building things for inbound marketing takes a spectacular amount of time. What I'm going to cover is the common tools that you're going to go build, blogs, presentations, webcasts, YouTube videos, etc. Talk about what they do for your career and how long they take because I build a lot of this stuff. These are the tasks that you can go do for inbound marketing. And I wrote these in order from top to bottom and from left to right. One of the easiest ways for us to get started is writing blog posts, because as I like to say, I can do this in mom's basement without talking to another human being. I can do it any time that I want, 24 hours a day. I can build several blog posts up in a weekend and schedule them out in advance. The next piece up, a white paper, takes much more work. I have to lay out a table of contents. I have to get a vendor to agree to publish it for me. And I used to think that, oh my God, people are amazing who get white papers. No, vendors want white papers. They will pay you for the white papers that you want to write because they want to slather their name all over stuff. Now, it's not going to make you rich overnight, but that vendor will help throw your white paper all over, plaster it in the bathrooms it pass, stick it on magnets. <laughs> books, books are kind of miserable. So I was co-author on 2008 Internals and Troubleshooting, and one of my co-authors had one of the best chapters I've ever read in a technical book. This one chapter just blew my mind right from the first paragraph. And I said, and I'm not gonna name his name, buddy, you know, how long did you take working on that? And he said, well, I totaled it up and it was about 2,000 hours on one chapter. This is why you usually see teams of co-authors on a book. This is also why you see the same book come out year after year or version after version. The author is hitting file, save as, and then adding new information in it instead of rewriting it again from scratch. You can't afford to write a book from scratch today. It's too much work. It's too long of a commitment. And sometimes people will say, well, I just really want to see my name on Amazon. Draw a comic book. And don't, you don't have to write a full-blown technical book. Do a pamphlet. You can self-publish if you want. And that way, at least you can get it in there and say, hey, mom, go search for me on Amazon. And she's like, I left you a five-star review, but there's four other one stars. I'm not sure what I should do about that. Thanks, mom. I appreciate it. Um, presentations, the next level down, is much harder for us because we have to leave mom's basement. Videos, this is very self-conscious. I mean, I used to think presenting was tough, standing up in front of a room full of people. Standing up in front of a video camera is way worse. When I do a presentation, it's not like I can hit stop and go, let me try that again. Let me try it just without so many, I was gonna say F-bombs, and then I was like, well, no, I can't say that up here. But then I was like, I guess I can say that up here, so as long as I don't say the F-bomb. Um, but with videos, you're constantly stopping it. Oh, let me, re let me say that a different way. Let me make it perfectly smooth. I said, um, again there. Let me make it a little cleaner. That's way harder, especially because you have to watch yourself on the video afterwards. That's, that can be kind of painful. Social media, I have it up here, but you shouldn't think of this as a career shot. This is a last ditch career shot when you have other things going on for you already. Social media helps you pr uh, present the other things up and get other people into your blog posts or presentations. And then down at the bottom, networking. Notice that I said networking doesn't scale and yet you find me here. I am here, some of it is giving back. I am a huge believer that we are so lucky. We have stood on the shoulders of giants. Other people have made it easier for us. It's our obligation to keep giving back to the community, to keep moving it forward. Just know that that's not necessarily going to put your career on a rocket ship. I do know people in the community who've had a job problem and other members of the community have helped them get a job very quickly. I just don't want to use that as my primary route for things like consulting because other people in the community are already doing consulting for themselves. It's not like they're all going to go, you're amazing, why don't you take all my work? No, I just club them in the alleyway and steal all their business cards. Um, the best tasks do four things. 
They force me to learn. And they help me help as many people as possible with as little work as possible. If you've ever emailed us a question, you may have seen one of our standard email templates. I'm sorry, but we just don't take questions in private. Right now, we're all working on consulting gigs. Please post your question on Stack Exchange, and then if you haven't got a good answer, within two, three days, email us and we'll take it from there. I want to help people in public because I want other people to Google and find those same answers. If I just give one guy a fish, it doesn't help other people eat. So if you ever ask me for a fish in private, I'm going to give it to you across the face. That's not true. Um, unless you pay me, in which case I'll hand it to you instead of throwing it across the face. Um, they act as inbound marketing, publishing the fact that you know something and then they start snowballing forward into something larger and larger. That's why I put these things in order, blog posts, then presentations, then videos. If you write a table of contents for a training class that you want to give next year, then you start writing blog posts to reinforce your table of contents. I used to think, that if I'd ever written about something, no one would want to come see me present about it. That's backwards. People read your blogs about a topic and go, oh, he knows that topic. I should go see his presentation on that topic. Building blog posts actually amps up the rest of this stuff. It forces other people to understand that you know a particular topic, like pantyhose filters for red-eared slider turtles. When you lay out that training class, you build every takeaway. So think of building your last slide first. What do I want people to take away from this training class? And then you write blog posts about that exact same thing. And you're probably thinking, no, no, seriously, if I, I can't charge money for a training class if I'm just blogging about the exact same thing that I already, you know, been presenting about. There, no one's going to be dumb enough to pay me present. How many of you sat in Kaylin Delaney's session this week? There's several of you. How many sat in Kendra Little's presentations this week? There's a lot of us. You guys know they have blogs, right? You know they have books? They've written actually all this stuff. I know the words are big, they're hard, they're on the page. It's so much more fun when there's dinosaurs and pictures. But same thing with me, right? Like anything that I've put up on, uh, online, I'm probably going to turn into a presentation one day. These things snowball together. The more that you write about stuff, you can then go take your resources and turn them into uh, presentations. You can turn them into white papers. Vendors will even pay you to bundle several of your blog posts together into a white paper or a webcast. MS SQL Tips, for example, will pay you to turn your blog posts into action articles that they can use. Writing serves lots of benefits. When you write about something, you will learn about something. Believe me, the commenters will tell you all the ways you're wrong. It doesn't work that way, trust me. Most of the time they're wrong, but then you have to go build a repro script to prove to them. Here you go, run this script, it'll show you this is exactly why you're wrong. Or you run that script and you're like, oh God, my worst fears have come true, I'm wrong. And that's how you learn. You want to do that in blog posts in mom's basement first so that you can cry with that bottle of Alexander's wine as opposed to doing it up on stage in presentations. Crying with wine is much more complicated. So what's it take to write? Typically, I'm looking at for a blog post between one to eight hours. On the high side of that is when I have something that's very technically complex and I have to build something that's a repro script with demos and screenshots. On the lower end of that, it's more conceptual. Here's why you should do something. Here's a problem I had recently with no demo scripts. When we talk about a white paper, white papers for vendors are typically 10 to 30 pages and you should expect to spend one to two days per page. On the lower side of that is when you're only doing lots of screenshots as part of it, but then you're still going to have to have a whole lot of technical verbiage in there to pull it off. For that's someone in the, trapped in the back who's trying to write a book, please, God, let me out. A book is one to two pages, one to two days per page, 200 to 400 pages is typical. You run the math on that, and it's really clear why you have to have teams of co-authors in order to tackle a book. These time estimates include what it will take to go build the topic, 
to decide exactly what you want to blog about, to sketch out what your outline looks like, write the whole thing, publish it, and then handle peer review afterwards or dealing with things like content or co uh, comments. I want you to do this on your own blog because you need to own your work. If you do it on someone else's website, and there are lots of other websites where you can go post blogs, when you're looking for a better career, your name needs to be all over this. You are the product. It's tempting to write at places like SQL Blog or at SQL Server Central or MS SQL Tips, but I need, whenever someone comes to read your work, I need your name across the top because I gotta start building that name recognition so that when they have a problem with something or when they see your resume or an email from you, they go, oh, Debbie, I've come across Debbie's site several times when I'm looking for issues with Service Broker or with R or whatever. If you wanna turn up and uh, bundle these things into an ebook or a real book or a white paper later, you can do that when you wrote the material on your site, but if you sold that material to someone else, it's much more challenging. Then, the concept of writing, I said it takes one to eight hours, including coming up with the ideas. If I ever sit down at WordPress, I, that's an instant uh, way for me to not have any ideas whatsoever. If I ever wanna have writer's block, I go sit down in front of an empty page. Man, that just does not work at all, it's terrifying. So what I like to do instead is, I just have, I use Remember the Milk for this, other people use GitHub. I wanna have a place where I'm just gonna go write down ideas and I am not going to work on them. These things hit me in the grocery line, you know, I'm at the checkout line somewhere, I'm at a stoplight, I'm driving down the freeway at 100 miles an hour, just kidding, just kidding. I use Siri for that, and I say, Siri, remind me to, what, and then it comes out as, buy Christmas lights on the floor of the boat, you know, strange, insane things. So I'll just write in all kinds of things that I wanna go blog about eventually. And the funniest thing for me is, I end up dumping them out on the web. I'm just like, well, these were all seemed like really good ideas, but I couldn't actually develop them into posts. Some of them I can develop into posts, but often I just end up trashing a lot of them. Once I have my list, then writing time is way easier. I like to, on Saturdays and Sundays, before my wife wakes up, so if I'll get up at four or 5 a.m., go walk the dog, come down, sit down at the computer, and then I can just go read through. Here's my list of ideas, now let me go through and execute on them. Because I guarantee you, I got no ideas on Saturday at 6 a.m. other than going out to McDonald's and getting a steak burger or steak uh, bagel. Just grab one, start writing through it. The first one will suck. Stephen King's On Writing is this book that's about writing and it's fantastic. And he said, really, the only way you do it is just at a certain time you sit down and you start writing and you don't care what pages you throw away. The first five or 10 pages are going to be garbage. You will rewrite those later. The idea is to just keep going. And then by the fifth or sixth page, you've actually got good stuff coming out of your word processor. Thank God, I find when I'm blogging, it doesn't take that long. Three or four paragraphs, and I'm like, oh, okay, that first stuff was garbage. I'm just gonna delete that, but now I'm at least into the mood, and I'm going, and I can uh, enjoy this thing. And when I'm done with a blog, never, ever, ever, ever hit publish. Well, there's one exception. If you're at an event like a past summit, and you wanna live blog an event, then it's appropriate to hit publish because it's happening right now. But the rest of the time, the instant that you get done writing that blog post, just click schedule. Schedule it for next week. Later, over the next couple of days, you're either gonna grow to love that blog post or grow to hate it, and you're gonna wanna tweak things about it. That same thing is gonna happen even if you click publish. If you go click publish on the post right now and release it out into the world, you are still going to grow to love or hate it in the next couple of days, but then it's too late. You can't take it back. One of the best feelings out there is on Saturday, if I can go through and write three or four blog posts in a row and hit schedule on each one of them, and I try to schedule no more than one a week because I just can't write that much unlike Eric, who can write like four pages or four blog posts a week. So I write them and just schedule them out for the coming weeks. I like to schedule for every Tuesday. 
I schedule them, and then it's such a cool feeling to go back and go, oh, I had a blog post got published today. I had totally forgotten I'd even written that. And then you're much more in love with the blog posts. You're like, wow, that stuff that I wrote back there was wonderful. It's fantastic. I would go find that myself in Google. You want to set up a rhythm where your blog posts go out at the same time, ballpark, every same day of the week. For example, on my personal site, I post every Tuesday morning. Tuesday mornings, my blog posts go out. On our company site, they go out Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. There's a huge rhythm in technical blogs. Your technical readers, stuff like SQL Server, it's only going to be Monday through Friday. Blog post traffic plummets on the weekend. It's just 10 times lower on the weekend than it is during the week. That's flipped around backwards if you write leisure blogs. If you write a cooking blog, a blog about the walking dead, whatever, your traffic is exactly flipped. It's higher on the weekends than it is during the week, which I always find funny because I thought people surfed for like fun stuff all day long while they work. At least that's what my employees do, according to my spyware software that I have surreptively installed. I don't want to write work that I'm not proud of. I only want to publish the stuff that I'm actually happy to have my name on. Don't feel like you have to write just to get something out there. Skip a week. Skip two weeks. If your passion isn't in it, what you'll learn over time, and several of my blogging friends have learned, is that their heart just isn't in it anymore. And they would rather, instead, go to work for a company rather than doing their own inbound marketing. They figure out after six months of this grind that they would rather have someone else doing the sales instead of them. And there's nothing wrong with that. When you write blog posts, there's two kinds of blog posts out there. Why or how? One of my favorite sayings is, how is boring and why is fantastic? But you need both. I need blog posts that explain to me why I should be doing something. Then I also need pure syntax blogs to tell me exactly how to do something. I guarantee that all of us in here who've worked with T-SQL, how many of us have gone and hit Pinal Dawe's blog like half a million times to get copy-paste syntax out of there? Yes, all of us have gone and hit that. He's the most popular blogger in the entire industry. All he does is how. All he does is T-SQL posts. And those are by far the most famous and popular blog posts out there. The why ones are just much less popular. The why ones are good for your regular readers, people who know your personality and they want to learn more about you. How is for Google. This is also why most of you probably don't know about Pinal or haven't talked to him other than you've seen his picture across the top. Because how is fantastic when you're Googling for something. Why is when you're building a personal bond with people. Let me tell you about myself and all the bad decisions that I've made. At the end of your writing day, Saturdays and Sundays for me at 10 AM, don't write until you run out of blog posts. Don't write until you feel exhausted. Another one of piece, Stephen King's pieces of advice, he said, you stop writing when you know exactly what's going to happen next. You're like, oh, I know what's going to happen. Susan's going to walk in through this door. She's, or Misery's going to walk in through the door. She's going to break the, break the guy's legs. You want to leave yourself something that you're excited about the next time you go and blog. Even if that means you don't finish a blog post, you leave it halfway done, or you leave your best material out there on the floor. Writing takes one to eight hours per blog post. White papers and books get much tougher than that. But this is what you do when you're going to go out and build an online reputation for yourself. This is the perfect time for us to stop for our natural break. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop here. For those of you who want to keep going and learning about presentations, inbound marketing, and all that, come back after the break. We'll keep going. Otherwise, for the rest of you, have a great pass, and I'll see you guys around Seattle. See you guys in 15 minutes. All right. So for uh, those of you who weren't in here at the start of the session, because this is a career talk, often people are afraid to raise their hands and ask questions. Why am I so underpaid? Um, so if you want to ask any questions, you can go to brennozar.com slash go slash ask. 
they will pop up on my iPad up here so that that way I don't know who sent them. That way you don't have to say, ask questions and feel nervous about it. You are also totally welcome to raise your hand and ask questions. It's just in case you're paranoid about a question or whatever. This isn't gonna work after the session ends. You're on your own then. This is just for right now. I keep asking you, but nothing's gonna answer anything. So what we talked about in the last module, or right where we finished up, was where did my clicker go? Who knows where I'm gonna walk around without a clicker? Um, was uh, talking about the writing mechanics and why you have to write. Let's take it up a notch now and we're gonna talk about presentations and then video training. For presentations, you are building your brand in front of other people. They are building a relationship with you. They're seeing that you're a real human being. You're not like a rabid fox. Um, you have some vague sense of personality. This isn't for everyone. It can be terrifying the first time that you get up and do it. But unlike blogging, you can actually get paid for it if you start doing, taking your presentations and building them into training classes, which sounded weird to me before I got into the business. If I give a presentation away at a conference, why would anyone ever want to pay to see it? Well, it's because there's a lot of people who aren't here. There's even people who will be here at a, a uh, sit in someone's session and go, my goodness, we have to get this information to everybody back at my office. And then they'll bring in a private trainer to go through and teach more things to the staff. The drawbacks of presenting is that these people are your potential customers, but not today. It's a long-term bet. When I go through and do presentations at user groups, SQL Saturdays, I am not going to get paid the next day. I'm not going to get paid the next month. I may not ever get paid. It's just a gamble that I'm gonna continuously work up and build my brand. It's also a really slow bet because every time that I present in, some, in front of someone, they may never remember who my name is. They, whenever they have an emergency strike, they may just Google randomly and find someone else. It's a really, really long-term bet and it takes, clicking on over there, come on buddy, there it goes, way longer than it looks to build a successful presentation. Lightning talks, oh, go oh, great, there's a new version of Java that's available. Guys, let's go find out what's in it. That's fantastic. How about never do Java again ever, please? Ever would be good. To build a five to 10 minute lightning talk, realistically it takes at least an hour or two. And if you wanna win speaker idle, you're talking about a dozen hours or more of preparation. If you wanna do a one hour session in front of a user group, that's easily eight to 16 hours worth of work to go through and write the abstract, write the material, take the demo screenshots, rehearse it at least once. And then the better that you wanna be at something, the larger time that you wanna put into it. For those of you, how many of you sat through how to think like the engine this week, earlier in the week? Yeah, several of us. I bet I've given that session 50 times. And I bet that's on the low side. Like I may have given it 75 or 100 different times. Because I give it to clients when clients are asking problems about indexing, I've given it to user groups. So yeah, by the time I'm standing up in front of a stage, it seems a lot more natural and I still screw things up and I'm not happy about that. If I wanna build several presentations up into a pre-con, like a training class, it can seem intimidating to submit a, a pre-con at a big conference like PASS, but SQL Saturdays offer pre-cons as well, and you can get paid directly for doing that. You can make, generally speaking, about 50 bucks a person who comes to your pre-con. So if you can get 50 people to come to your pre-con, it's a nice bonus that happens there. What you're gonna do if, if you want to build a pre-con, you build the abstract of what you wanna teach a year from now. Then you go out and write all of the present or all the blog posts that you'll need in order to write those presentations. Every takeaway bullet that's a, uh, the end of a presentation needs to be an entire blog post by itself. What I love about this approach is you are actually writing the words you're going to say out loud. And when you write them down, it's easier for you to remember up on stage the kinds of concepts that you wanna cover. That's why I put writing first. Writing blog posts first helps you rehearse and practice the kinds of written communication that will get the word out there, which will also help you market your presentations when you wanna give them down the road later. If you're known for having blogs about that concept, then you're off to the races. 
Finally, there's videos. And videos suck because you have to have the blogs and the presentations first, and then, yes, Tom. Don't forget to mention virtual chapters. Don't forget to mention virtual chapters. So that would be in the presentations line, virtual chapters are online groups that pass where you can get in front of a webcam and they meet every month. So there's one on virtualization that Tom happens to run. Um, there's on uh, performance tuning, DBA fundamentals, BI, several different ones. And they're always looking for presenters. Same thing with your local user groups. And it's okay if you suck. Most of them actually do suck. I usually suck. That's funny, that's how I got into presentations. I was in Miami, I was in South Florida, and I went to a user group presentation and I was sitting in there. It was the first user group presentation I've ever been to. And the presenter was horrible, it was really bad. And I watched him and I went, this is a full room full of people. They're actually watching him and they're appreciative of him. If he sucks and he gets people, I can suck and it'll be okay. And believe me, I sucked when I started. I'm just barely getting better now. So next up is videos. So things like podcasts, YouTube videos, tr online training classes. What's cool about videos is they stick. They stick around for forever. You upload them to YouTube, you upload them to a training class provider, and then people see your face and they build a relationship with you. Just like with our Office Hours podcast, people are always coming up to us and saying, it feels like I know you because I've been watching you through your window through the last you know, year. They also, also say, oh, Brent, you look so much taller in person. Eric, you look shorter in person. Because we all have this universal height on a webcam. Everyone thinks that they're all the exact same uh, height. The drawbacks of video is that your words aren't transcribed, so they're not as easy to find via Google. This is why we transcribe our office hours so that everything we say is written down in a form somewhere that people can go and search and find us. It's really hard to find good YouTube videos on a particular topic because the keyword matching just isn't all that good. People may not stick around for the whole thing. Just like in user group presentations, sometimes people will leave. In videos, people leave all the time. They bail out after 30 seconds or 60 seconds going, I don't like this guy's haircut. And building a good video is really, really hard. Really, really, really hard. Generally, you're looking at 5x the video's runtime. So if I have a 10 minute podcast or a one hour training session, you're looking at between two and five hours worth of work in order to do this. Because remember, this doesn't even include the time to build the material. You have to go stand in front of a webcam, hook up your microphone, talk for the one hour, then go back and edit it together, piece out all the ums and ahs, upload it to YouTube, edit together the page that it's gonna be on. This is a spectacular amount of work. And if you wanna sell it to a training class, then you're gonna to have to go through a peer editing review process of your material before, as well as your material after you record. It's also not free. There's a few pieces of hardware that you're going to have to grab. This is my personal list of stuff that I use, and it's dirt, I say dirt cheap. There are people out there who take audio seriously. Richie, for example, spends way more on it than this. But this is kind of table stakes on what it takes in order to record a video that will sound okay. You know, record producers aren't calling me for my uh, input here. I should also say, I actually should have started out with, so in case you're worried about taking pictures of the slides, I'm gonna pop out and I'm gonna go over to SlideShare. Now this, the slides are up on Pass's deck, or Pass's website. Usually I just find it's easier to find them via SlideShare. So if I go to SlideShare and I say 500, whoops, 500 level guide career internals. If I search on there, the slide deck's already up, except it's not, oh, hold on a second. My uploads, it's probably not public yet. Let's edit that. My presentation is so heavy that it's coming down from above. Uh, privacy settings and let's make it public, ta-da. Okay, anyone can update it and download it. 
So you can download the whole slide deck right there. If you go search for a 500 level guide to career internals on SlideShare, you have the whole exact session. You can page through it, all 173 slides. I also tend to go back and update my slides with more stuff afterwards, but the whole shebang slide deck is already up there. So now you can, I should have told you in the beginning so you could stop taking pictures, but I love it when you people take pictures of things. It's really fun when you hold up iPads, because then you look like morons and I can have a little smile inside and I can laugh. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding at all. The ones who I really laugh at are surfaces. If you hold up a surface to take a picture, I'm like, come on, lose the $2,000 camera. Um, the end result of this, for YouTube, you're not getting paid for it. You can make a very tiny amount on ads, but you're just getting your work out there as much as possible so that people see you. The amazing part, when you're going to work for, you're going to apply for jobs, when you walk in and you talk to someone, whether you're applying for a full-time job or you're just talking with them about working as a client, they immediately say things like, I feel like I know you. They have a relationship with you already which is not nearly as creepy as it sounds. It's actually not so bad. Live webcasts, this quality is much worse, but it's so much more fun when I'm interacting with people live and taking questions. If you wanna just do throwaway work, if you wanna experiment with video but not keep it around for your career, Periscope is one of the most popular options where you can li record live videos. People don't go to this for tr SQL Server training. I do wish there was something like Twitch for SQL Server. Twitch is a game, how many of you guys have watched Twitch? So it's for the rest of us who haven't, who have real lives. Twitch is a, a thing where you can watch other people play video games, which I always thought was extremely stupid until I watched it. I'm like, this is great, it's like watching someone good do something, as opposed to if you watch me play a video game, it's a whole lot of herp and the derp. Um, Vendors will also pay you to do webcasts. Generally, vendors will pay you between $250 and $500 in order to do a webcast. So you have to bring them your already done presentation and then they will schedule it, they'll manage getting people to attend, they'll work with you to write about it on your blog post. You can then go say, I did a webcast for whoever and pick up an easy 200 to 250 to 500 bucks. I say easy, except it's not easy in the sense that you already have to have the presentation done. You have to go write that thing first and then give it to them. And you still get access to it. It's still your own work that you can co keep redoing in training classes and things like that. Then, if you wanna really take it up a notch, after you've already done those things, you can sell video training classes. And there's a few different ways that you can do it. Pluralsight is probably the most popular in the SQL Server community. People pay a flat price for Pluralsight subscriptions. How many of us have got a Pluralsight membership? Yeah, lots of us, especially the developer community. It's really popular. People pay a flat price and then you get paid a percentage of what their fee was based on how many people watch your video. So the more popular your video is, the more mainstream the topic is, the more money that you can make. The drawback with this though is you don't really have control over the production process. They may not want your shining face on the video. You don't get information about who bought the video. You can't run sales. Like if you wanna give free access for 90 days or give it to a client, you don't have that capability. If you wanna self host or go Udemy or Kajabi, then you have a better chance of owning this thing from start to finish, designing the video look and feel that you want, setting the price that you want, and contacting your customers directly. There's no one right way. Both of these ways work. I took the bottom approach, but there's lots of people who take the plural side approach as well. I went for the bottom approach because I want to know who my customers are and I want to be able to give them things like a Black Friday sale. And I want to be able to know these people and talk to them by name. Doing video classes, this stuff is seriously hard. You can outsource some of it. So there are places like Odesk and Elance where you can hire video production people and audio production people. But remember, this is still the last part of the chain after you've already written up the blog posts and the presentations and rehearsed them well enough at user group first. Now there's two down there that kind of grayed out. Remember, social media, this is not really a tool for you to help you get your next job, not quickly or efficiently, because all of us are on there talking about cats and YouTube and animated GIFs. The bottom one, community organizing and volunteering, 
is good. You should do it. I love doing it too. Just know that it's not a rocket ship to get you your next better job within the span of a year. So now we covered how these things benefit your skills and how much time they're going to take. Now let's talk about you actually doing it over the course of the next year. Yes, you don't have to if you don't want to. You're only saying that, that's okay. <laughs> I'll give you 15 minutes to stop. <laughs> Yes. Where do skills and upgrading knowledge play in? So my, what's really funny is you already know right now everything you need to know to get a better job. There are so many jobs out there that are desperate for even relatively normal database skills uh, or you know analytic skills, whatever. What they really need is you want to find the best ones. You want the best ones to come running to you. But what I normally tell people, anybody who's been to user groups, pass, any training classes, you're already at the cream of the crop. Now it's time to work on the personal side. There's this, uh, another great saying in careers. Careers all boil down to two things. Do good things and tell people. If you only do one of those two things, you're going to fail. If you only do good things and no one knows about it, it's not going to matter. I mean, you feel better at night, you know, it's all of that, like giving money away or whatever. But you also have to tell people about it. If you only tell people about it, and I can't hold up that finger by itself because then I get in trouble. If you only tell people about it and you don't do any good things, we know people like that too, right? People are like, I have seven years of experience with SQL Server 2013. Those people are sucked too. You have to do both, do good things and tell people. It's really about telling people. I also find that when I'm blogging about stuff, I tend to learn too, but yeah. More questions so far. All right. So on this, now is the bottom line. I need to go figure out what I'm gonna do across the span of the next 12 months. And I just lay out a calendar of what a week would look like. And I divide it up into ballpark two hour chunks per day. So I have my waking hours down through midnight. I do not stay up that late. Believe me, sleep comes in on the bottom two of those lines. It's all down to how many hours realistically you're going to spend working on this stuff. I'm gonna say something radical and politically incorrect. I was able to spend a whole lot of time on my blog because I didn't have children and because my wife liked it when I would go do things on my own. Why don't you go over there and do other things? We have opposite sleep schedules. She sleeps in until 10 or 11 a.m. I go to bed really early, and then I have all this nice time in the morning in order to blog and do the th things that I'm passionate about. Do we ever actually talk to each other over FaceTime and instant message? <laughs> no, it's, it's actually funny. This, so the instant like 10 a.m. hits, I'm done. I'll walk away from the computer unless she's doing something like shopping. I am done and completely walk away from it. And the same thing at 5 p.m. at night, I try to close down, walk out of the office, not take things around. I'll answer if one of our teams sends a message or something like that, I'll answer. But otherwise, I am done. I want out. I like to think that I work less time than anybody else. But when I have those two windows, Saturday morning and Sunday morning from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., I am razor sharp focused just on the blogging stuff. Unless she wakes up and then I get really pissed off. Juan, go back to bed. You know, more time still. More questions so far. So yes. Oh, I could be making money. Oh, no, um, so generally the way that I try to work and with our, our team as well, is I try to do three to five days a week of work, but the week, the hour, the days tend to be four to eight hours, generally more towards the four to six side. I want them to have at least two hours a day free to relax, learn, talk in the Slack channel, and I'm the same way, like when I do consulting, most of my work these days is on-site training, like I'll go on-site and do commun or, uh, uh, company type work, in which case I'm there for four or five days, but I'll only try to do that two weeks a month. The other times per month are spent managing, blogging, doing research on stuff. 
I used to, when we had a larger company, I would work three days a week and blog and do management for two days a week, and then do the blogging stuff Saturday and Sunday mornings. The more, if you agree, from a business point of view, this sounds really weird, you want your rate to be as high as possible. Duh, Brent. No, it's so that you can work less hours and spend more time sharpening your knives, getting better at your skills and getting the word out there. The way that the, I look at our scripts is even company-sponsored development. Our clients sponsor us basically to write stuff like SP Blitz and SP Blitz Cash to make our lives easier, make our consulting faster, which just ends up getting us more clients. Morka, yes. How do you, so your question about setting rate? Yes. Gerald Weinberg has this, the question is how, where do you set your rates at? Gerald Weinberg has this excellent book and there's a list of resources at the end. One of the books is called Secrets of Consulting. And in the book, The Secrets of Consulting, he says, for your price, you set it according to the principle of least regret. You don't wanna regret it if they say no, oh man, I should have gone with a lower price. I did that all my life. I would set my rate like after hours at 95 bucks an hour. Oh, I just want to win the work. And I thought I was in competition with big, huge consulting firms. And then when I would go do that work, I would regret it. Oh God, I just spent all my day working and now I got, I want to go out with my wife and all I have to do is I have to go sit down and at this $95 an hour crap. So the least regret thing is the least regret if they say no or if they say yes. You don't want to regret it if they say, sure, I'd love to buy you for that. So you just try to use that to set your own price in a way that you'll get excited if you get the job and you won't be depressed if they say no. Like if you charge, you know, $500 an hour, of course, you'll be ecstatic if they say yes, but no one's ever going to say yes. Sometimes they'll say yes. They're going to have guns at the door. It's going to be ugly. Uh, more questions so far? Yes. Yes. What, yes, what happens if real life gets in the way and my schedule me gets messed up? I am very zen with my calendar. I just go, if when real life, real life happens, that pushes everything by a week, that's fine. I don't care, because there's no deadline on this. Whenever I get the ebook out, whenever I get the training class out, I'm cool with it. I'll beat myself up because I wish I would have gone faster, but I want to live my best life. I don't want to work 70 hours a week thinking I need to beat some deadline. The whole reason I work, and I'll have an emotional slide near the end where I, I talk about my dad. Um, the whole reason I'm working is so that I can spend time with my family and you know, the people that I love. So when those things interrupt, I embrace those. I'm all about those things. Except when my wife wakes up at eight o'clock, then I get pissed. Go back to bed. More questions so far. Please, honey, sleep in. Then I give her Tylenol. What? Yes? <laughs> Yes. And your wife is your day job. Mm -hmm. You can have that much time, particularly in the I wonder if money. Mm -hmm. But if you get that much time into the consulting stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're working two plus five days. Yes. So the question is what happens if you're, and I'm going to make numbers up just to show the point. What happens if you're making 150000 a year as a database administrator and you believe if you went independent, you could pull two hundred? But in order to go independent, you're gonna to have to go blocking out these portions of your day. You're already, for your 150 grand a year job, you are working your tail off. Say so you're working, tail off is the wrong term, maybe 50 hours a week, which is a lot to me that's working my tail off. But you know, at 150, I might have made that decision. Well, how do I make the decision to invest even more time? Generally, you don't. By the time you're frustrated enough that you go, I gotta get a better job and I'm tired of this one, I'm gonna say something awful and I want my employees to cover their ears. When you want a better job, you go, you know what, I'm gonna do the bare minimum at my current job in order to not get fired and then invest the rest of the time in myself down the road. It's a horrible thing to say and when they come out of my mouth, no one's ever gonna hire me again. 
But when you want to bail out, that's what you have to do is go, this is short term, let me do enough not to get fired and go do something else. But it's really tough. In the, in the business, they call this golden handcuffs. You want to pay somebody enough that they really, oh, I, I want to leave, it's not awesome, but there's so much money. That's why they give you bonuses like once a quarter with stock grants and they only vest you know, a year from now so that you're always sticking around for the next round of vesting to happen. It's what's, so how do I d determine between side consulting versus high full time a year jobs? For me, it comes down to do you want to do sales? Do you want to blog and present and do sales? Those are totally unpaid. There's not a dollar's worth of work in it. When we started our consulting company, there were four of us initially who started me, Jeremiah, Kendra, and Tim Ford. And very early on, Tim was in a position where he was had, had the great job that you talked about. And he goes, you know what? I don't want to do all this unpaid work. This is for the birds. I have kids. They're growing up. I'm never going to see them again. This is my one chance. And he said, I'm going to go ahead and bail out here because this just isn't the right lifestyle for me. And it can change from time to time. His kids are going off to college now. He's doing more consulting. So it can totally change based on your own life priorities. If you have the luxury of a lot of open windows on this calendar where you don't mind doing unpaid work, then the consulting thing makes sense. Otherwise, if you can build up a good enough reputation just amongst the people who know you that you can get those $200,000 a year DBA jobs working at hedge fund type things or analytics, stay with it because it's that way at least you don't have to do any blogging or anything like that. Which, and it sounds, sometimes people go, oh my God, 200,000 a year. I've seen DBA jobs at 200 to 250,000 a year. There were spectacular compromises involved with those jobs. Super high pressure hedge funds, dot coms where you're the only person on call 24 seven, you know, downtown New York City. Those jobs are out there, they just come with a price. More questions so far. All right, oh, I should have, oh, nobody's using the online form. All right, so when I block out these time, and I figure out how much windows I really have, this helps me be so much more realistic about what I can actually accomplish per week. I know some people who started blogs and go, oh man, I just can't keep up. I can only write one blog post a month. Sketch out your calendar. That may be all the time you have. In which case, consulting isn't for you. That's not the right fix, unless you're going to work for a consulting company who will bring you the work automatically. If you want to go through and do the work yourself and bring in customers yourself, this is what your weekend has to look like. In my case, I've got about eight hours per week that I can dedicate to blogging SEO. This is the work that I do each one of those weekends. And the reason that I do it is because I want to be able to make these compromises myself. I want to be able to invest the time to put in so that I can control my own destiny. This is my dad, dad and I in Alaska. And he had always wanted to go on an Alaskan cruise. God bless him, it's gonna be a miracle if I can get through this without crying. Dad worked his whole life really hard, went through three different careers, trying to take care of me and my sister. And, you know, he gets to the end of his life, he's never seen Alaska, and he watches Deadliest Catch and, you know, Bering Sea Gold and all those things. And I was able to take him on a cruise three times because he just loved it. His eyes lit up, best experience he'd ever had, took all these pictures, has all these things over his house. And that's what you work for. You want to be able to control when you do things and when you don't. So that now, if I want to go take a week with my dad in Alaska, I can go do that. I want the kind of company that will let me make those choices. Whereas when I was a database administrator, I did not have those choices. I didn't have the income that would let me do it. So I made the purpose, purposeful decision to say, I am blocking out my weekends and I am going to figure it out. I am going to work my tail off on those weekends to do the work I need to do to roll this snowball down the hill 
so that I can make those life decisions and take dad places, take care of my sister. This is the hardest part of this entire seminar. Anyone can write a blog. There are tons of blog post instruction manuals out there. There are tons of presentation po blog posts out there. For you to do this, for you to buckle up and actually do it, the time is the hardest part and there are zero shortcuts. You have to do the work, whether you do less work during the day, take out time out of your life. And everything that you do has to be as evergreen as possible. When you write a blog post, it needs to pay off for you three years from now. It needs to be the kind of blog post that isn't just a throwaway blog post. You only have, say, four hours a week or eight hours a week at this keyboard. You need to write something that will keep bringing people in for years. Don't just write about, I saw a movie yesterday. I think it's important that you have work-life balance. You need to focus and write on things that people will actually pay you for later. The blog posts don't have to be perfect. You want to th throw poop against the wall like a chimpanzee at the zoo. Write whatever you can, but it needs to be focused on what you're going to get paid for down the road. Don't just write about Service Broker because you think it's interesting or no one else is writing about it. Have a plan so that at the end of the year, you have 52 blog posts that you can be proud of and people will be pouring in the front door, bringing you work to do. So then, now let's talk about kicking it up a level. And when I talk about kicking it up a level, it's bringing people in your front door, having people pay you for work after they found your blog posts. The first part about this is just understanding who you are and what makes you different from everybody else out there. I'm gonna show you a brand and I want you to think about three words. If you wanna write them down, you can, you don't have to. But think about three words about the logo you're about to see. So if you had to sum that brand up in three words, what would they be? <laughs> How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? Ah, see, sometimes brands are good. Sometimes brands are not so good. Your brand is the three words that people think of whenever they see your name. Sometimes it's fun to think, I'm gonna be SQL whatever, you know, SQL Rusty Bucket, whatever I wanna be. Think, use your name. We need to get people to associate things with your name. We're gonna think of you and then performance tuning or you and then data modeling. Brand words describe the product that you put out. They describe the kinds of people that buy your product, where you are in the pricing tier. For example, when you think of Walmart, you might think of inexpensive, huge inventory, screaming children in the stores. Um, it defines where you are relative to everybody else. And companies take this really seriously. They do all kinds of branding studies. You may have been in the, uh, in the past keynote this morning or uh, on Wednesday where they had those four V's pointing at each other. It's like a Mexican standoff of V's. This is our new branding symbol. I like to think of it as anything other than because it's like less than, greater than. I'm not quite sure how that correlates to community, whatever. I need to come up with three words that focus on, this is why I don't get invited back to the bloggers table. <laughs> this is right here. Brent did that, we're gonna make him pay. Um, you have to know yourself and you have to come up with three words that describe yourself. Back around 2010, when I went through this exercise, I came up with the three words of technical, approachable, and likable. This is around about the time when I started going after the Microsoft Certified Master thing because I'm like, well, I know what I'm talking about. I'm decently good at SQL Server, but maybe people know me as a goofball. So I want to be known as a goofball, but I also want to be known as technical and I wanted to be known as approachable. So I put my email out there, I said connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, whatever, because I wanted people to know that they could come and talk to me at any time. Over time I learned, I, I don't really like you people. So I changed my words, because I don't really want to be approachable. 
these are, that's not true, and you didn't laugh, which means it is true. Um, in 2016, the current words that I like to use are pain relieving. I constantly talk about pain relief during presentations. You need to be feeling a performance pain before you talk to me. Experienced, I've actually done things, I've seen things. And provocative, I like to do things that grab people by the shoulder and force them to think. When I went through this exercise at one of our free cons, our pre-cons, it's all about personal branding, I asked the attendees to come up with three words to describe themselves. This word cloud that's up on the screen represents the words that attendees chose in order to label themselves. There's a lot of really good ones on there. Data mining, realistic, trustworthy, informative. I, there were really wild ones. One of the guys from Israel said special forces. He served through the Israeli Special Forces, Matan Youngman of the SQL Server Radio podcast. And he said he wanted to be identified as a Special Forces person. And I was like, well, there's ways you can do that, but you also get banned from the convention center when you try that trick. So what you want to do is pick three to 10 words to describe yourself. Now, I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about those and sketch those down. The more specific you can be, the easier it is to be unique. The Special Forces guy, for example. There's no one else who's a Special Forces guy in the SQL Server community. The more unique you can be, the easier it is to stand out. The more generic your brand names are, trustworthy, reliable, everyone wants to be seen as trustworthy and reliable, you're just competing with the Geek Squad and every other Microsoft support, every other co consultant out there. You want to think about the words that mean the most to you individually because they're also the easiest to build into all of your blogging material and your presentations. For example, I like to think about race cars all the time in my presentations, so I end up using those a lot in my decks. These words become your elevator pitch. As for startups, this concept of elevator pitch means you step into an elevator with someone, happens to be the CEO of Walmart or whatever, and says, oh, what do you do? And then you're able to describe it in a sentence or two out loud and just get the words out. I make SQL Server faster and more reliable. It's my entire elevator pitch, that's it. I've worked on it over and over so I can get it as short as possible. I make Microsoft SQL Server as fast as my, see, I, would do, I say it so often I can say it easily. I make SQL Server faster and more reliable. That's just all that I have to say. If someone has SQL Server, then they get it. But then marketing is how I get other people to know what my brand words are. Marketing is horrible. Marketing is slimy, but I'm going to show you the easy, less slimy way to do this. Step one, you pick your brand name. Don't pick something like SQL Tiki Bar or something like that. Pick your name. You only have so much to spend on advertising. So when, I, when I say spend on advertising, it's your personal time. It's not money. I never want to see people spending money on this. I want it to be your physical name. If you have a common name, make it your full name. It's John Sansom Jr. Step two is getting people to memorize what your brand is, AKA your name, and the brand words around your brand. Outbound marketing is ads. And you see ads all day long. They, we try to escape them, and then they end up embedding them in cartoons and stuff that we're trying to watch right in the middle of BMW doing BMW films or injecting their cars into movies. Inbound marketing is different. Inbound marketing means I'm going to build something, and people will come to me. This is what blogging is. This is what presenting is. This is what building scripts are. I'm going to build something, and then people are going to act actively reach out and subscribe to me. Comcast would love you to subscribe to their newsletter, Dial Soap, Chrysler Cars. They would trip over themselves if you would actually subscribe to their newsletters. Anybody in here want to subscribe to anything like that? Of course not. No one wants to opt into more spam. But when you know a topic very well, like we do in here, 
Inbound marketing is exactly what you want. You want to go write things like blog posts and presentations and do webcasts, and then people will follow you around for your expertise and for your personality. What this means, yes. Yes, you, so you see me market to other technologists, but you don't see me marketing to people who sign the checks, yes. And you're wondering why, right? Like how do I reach those people? I don't market to them, I do this. I write blog posts, white papers, do webcasts, whatever. And the people who write the checks, Google. They Google for why is my SQL server slow? What does all this blocking mean? And my stuff keeps coming up. It's mostly Eric's stuff, let's be honest, but our blog, keeps coming up, and then after a few of these hits, even when they don't understand what the writing is, they go, it says consulting at the top, why don't we just call them? You know, why don't we just go have them figure out if they can solve it? And it's the same thing with like index tuning and stuff like that. I may have people in the room who go, wow, this guy really seems to know a lot about performance tuning, why don't we just call him? It's really funny how it works. Yeah, here you go. Yes, Hugo says that uh, we also get work from people who sit in the audience and go, I'm stuck, I've run out, you know, I've hit the skills gap, but I know someone who can help. If I drew a Venn diagram of where our business comes from, it's really weird and you're gonna think I'm utterly crazy. There's a circle of people who know us from the scripts and from the blog posts who use our stuff to solve their problems proactively there's a separate circle over here of people whose pants are on fire and they're Googling to find a solution as quickly as possible. There is some overlap, but not nearly as much as you would think. I go to the past summit, not to get my name out there, but to give back, to go out and get my word out as much as I can that, hey, here's how you have a better career, here's how you make your, your uh, SQL Server perform better. If you ever remember me, great, but let's be honest, you guys are in the same business that I am. You're out solving your SQL Server problems. We're not in competition, my calendar's full. I'm doing pretty well. Not phenomenal, but doing pretty well. It's not like if I go, oh, I'm gonna hide all my stuff under a blanket, you guys can never know. No, just go take it, go get stuff. Plus, we look at like SP Blitz, you wouldn't believe how many people run SP Blitz, assess the health of their servers, and then a puddle of urine forms under the chair because they're terrified. Oh God, how do I get out of here as quickly as possible? So the next thing, yes, yes. Thank you. Does, it, does the stuff that we put out with all the branding have any kind of benefit? Um, I think it's a really long-term bet. You're talking like the logos and stickers and you know, stuff like that. I, for me, it's a really long-term bet, but it's when I was in databases, I would follow people like Brian Knight of Pragmatic Works. I'm like, this guy's amazing, he's fantastic. If he had any kind of stickers, I'd put them on my laptop because it's like being part of a club. You know, it's like suddenly there are other people who are involved. And I put other people's stickers, like on my badge, there's a bunch of badges from other companies, just because it's fun to be part of the club. I don't think it results in any additional sales though, but it's cheap, you know, it's really cheap to do. More questions? Yes. They're not motivated if they quit after a few days. Yeah. How do you be motivated to write something? It's, uh, so whenever I hit escape and I go into a web browser, I'm, I'm gonna pull something up and it's probably not appropriate, but it's really, really good. So, this is gonna be the last presentation I ever give a pass. Uh, <laughs> writing, figure it the F out. So there is a phenomenal post. Juggling writing in a job, figure it the blank out. If you want it, you have to do the work. If you don't want it, you won't do the work. 
It's like me, I'm not really motivated to lose weight because I don't exercise that often. You know, I can say that, oh, I'd really like to be at a lower weight. If you want something, you have to figure it out and no one else is gonna do it for you. You just have to set the deadlines and do it. Yes. Yes. So the question was for everybody in here, when, when you, you're writing something and you can't figure out what, you, you wanna expand more topics beyond what you know, and you, can't, you don't have the answers and you're worried and you go to ask other people, don't write about what you don't know, only write about the stuff that you do know and can prove really easily. The stuff that you find interesting is very different than what your readers find interesting. I used to think that I was writing for people like Paul White, Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Kaylin Delaney. No, those people aren't reading my blog. I'm writing for people who are lower than me, quote unquote, people who are behind me in the career train. You're the same thing. Don't write for people at your level, write for people behind you. Because there's so many, think, always think of the SQL Server community like a pyramid. There's fewer people on top than there are at the bottom. Don't write for the people up top. There's like seven of them. They're not gonna read your blog. Write for the great masses of developers out there, accidental DBAs who are following in your footsteps. Think about how bad your life sucked over the last two years where you're trying to learn this stuff. Those are your target audience people. All right, so back over into the presentation. Hopefully everyone got a screenshot of that so they can remember the moment where I did that and bad things happen. So when you talk about, we talk about putting your uh, brand words into your work, for example, like special forces or technical, approachable, and likable. You wanna put your brand words out into your work. If you like, for example, Formula One cars, you wanna shove those into your work. And you don't wanna be subtle. You wanna be right out there. Think about how outbound marketing works. These things are not subtle in the least. Buy a Louis Vuitton bag and you too can be traveling in the Bahamas just like Sean Connery. No, you're gonna be somebody at the mall schlepping around with a Louis Vuitton you know, clutch because you can't afford the big bag. Chevy, another example here. So look at the reflection down there, it's kind of subtle. They're saying that if you buy a brand new Camaro now, you're tied in with all the legacy and history of all the awesome Camaros they've ever done. When you do inbound marketing, when you write blog posts and presentations and webcasts, they need to be in the face. They need to have your brand front and center. Back when I was really into race cars, I did a session over at SQL Bits and I did the whole thing around performance tuning for race car drivers. Because I know I was going over to Europe, those guys love Formula One, much more than us Americans, we just like NASCAR, go fast, turn left. Formula One, they're a little smarter, they can turn in both directions. So I wrote this whole session based around, I said we're having a tough time in the race car industry, lots of people are losing their jobs, so we need to retool Formula One drivers so that they can have the skills to succeed as a database administrator. So I taught them lessons all based on Formula One stuff, turning it into race cars. Some of you may have heard me talk about TempDB being the public toilet of SQL Server where all kinds of nasty, disgusting, filthy things happen inside there. It's a fun joke that we like to get as database administrators, but zooming in a little closer and looking at my left on my profile, I make SQL Server faster and more reliable. You go to Instagram, I make SQL Server faster and more reliable. You go to Facebook, I make SQL Server faster and more reliable. I want to drum it into people that they know this is what I do. I'm not blogging about R, I'm not blogging about Polybase, I'm not blogging about analytics. These things are all cool. I love DeWitt's talk. I'm so into DeWitt's stuff. When we talk about sharding databases, data warehouses, sharding NoSQL systems, I find these things amazing, but I don't have enough time to blog about those things. I need to focus just on the things that I want to blog about and then I'm gonna get help from vendors. Vendors will help me with this because I can bring them my presentations with my own branding in it. 
I'm Brent Ozar. I make SQL Server faster and more reliable. Would you like me to do a session for you, Idera, Dell, SQL Sentry, SolarWinds, whoever, would you like to do a session together on how we solve these pains? And they will pay you to build it even though it has your own brand words in it, and they will market you to their mailing lists. And all of the stuff that you're going to do, you're gonna give away for free. You're gonna give it away for free because you always need to keep in mind what your product is. You always wanna be selling something, but the product is you. When you're looking for a full-time job, give away your blog posts, give away your presentations, give away your webcast. Sure, charge a little for your time if you're gonna be spending time out on it, but the material itself, let it loose for free to the world. You, on the other hand, your time should be paid for. Our idea here is that we're gonna give away our expertise in terms, of, in terms of written material so that people know where to find us and where to hire us at. Examples out in the real world in meat space. How many of you saw The Martian by Andy Weir, the, the movie, Matt Damon in it? That book was free. Andy Weir could not sell it. He tried selling it to one publisher after another and he ended up saying, you know what, I'm just gonna give it away for free online. It became so popular online that a publisher bought the rights from him and then a movie house optioned the rights for a movie as well. He gave the book away for free. Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom is one of my favorite books ever by Cory Doctorow. It is still free. The whole book is published under Creative Commons. You can go get it and read it and it's in my uh, resources section as well. Linux of course, is a totally free operating system. And we used to think, who on earth could possibly make money giving away our, an operating system? The SQL Server world has our own similar things. You can get your own free answers over at Stack at SQL Server Central. You can get your own free training. You can get your own free scripts. There's so much free stuff out there because those people are selling something else, their time. The biggest secrets that I can give you about career internals is if there's something that can be given away for free, it will be. And you want to be the person who's known for giving it away for free, whether it's blog posts, scripts, tools, apps, anything. These are the days of open source. Microsoft's going to have a rocky road ahead of it as it starts to work through this. If it can be given away for free, it will and you want to be the person giving it away because the money will come afterwards through other sources. Man, I have covered so much in terms of ground here, so, but I wanna leave you guys, for those of you who are interested in digging deeper with my very favorite stuff out there. This is my favorite list of books in this order. Number one, Getting Things Done is a productivity book, and productivity books usually sound like just work harder, be at peace with working harder. This actually isn't about this at all. This is about understanding when you should work on various things and when you should just hang it up and go be with your family. Permission-based marketing is about building something really cool that people will actually follow. They will reach out to you and throw jobs at you and money. The Lean Startup by Eric Ries is about building the smallest thing you can and then pivoting, watching what people find interesting about it. Don't spend six months of your life building something that no one may ever be interested in because our customers always change their minds. The blue ocean strategy is about going where there's not a red ocean. If you're a shark, you don't wanna go where all the blood is because there's already a bunch of sharks there and you're gonna get your butt kicked. You wanna go somewhere else where the sharks are not and find new food that you're not in competition for. In SQL Server and technology, it's the same thing. I wanna go where there's no one else at and go claim that ground for myself. ProBlogger, the subtitle of this is how to get a six-figure income while writing a blog which sounds cheesy, we in this room, we can get a six-figure income even without writing a blog, but all the techniques in there are magical. They help you understand how to write blog posts, how to set up WordPress, and how to go about uh, optimizing the search on your WordPress. 
Secrets of Consulting, when you decide you want to take the independent route, is the best Bible startup for consultants ever. I say Bible, it's not religious, it's just written really beautifully. Not that the Bible's written really beautifully. Look, I'm going off script, these things happen. 50 management ideas is just one management book per couple of pages, so you can scan through it and understand a whole lot of things like the Blue Ocean Strategy in just a few pages. The Clue Train Manifesto was a series of theses out in the, not feces, but theses, out in the late 1990s about how business is really changing. It's really evergreen and still true today. The SQL Server industry is still learning about a lot about that. And Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom is actually a murder mystery, but it's set in the future in a world where your social credibility is currency. If lots of people like you, you can live in a nice house, eat steak dinners, but if you do something bad and the public finds out, your credibility goes down to zero and you're living in the, in the basement. My bookmarks are all out there completely open to the public. If you go to pinboard.in slash u colon Brento, everything that I bookmark and find interesting is all out there on Pinboard. They have a tag cloud over on the right hand side. And if you liked this session, you will likely like the tags that are over there on the left hand side. If you didn't like that uh, ses this session, you may like the cars tags or art tags that are also inside there. And then I want to leave you with people to go talk to and follow outside of our industry. <laughs> when I put together this session and I submitted it to the summit and I actually got accepted, I'm like, are you kidding me? And somebody from the abstract committee said, well, if you can't talk about it in this industry, who can? You've done such a good job. And I'm like, no, I'm herping the derp. I suck at this. Those people are amazing. Steve Cam beat this business, built this business called Nerd Fitness, where it's a, a leveled up game for those of us who are kind of geeks. He bases your fitness around an adventure. He wrote a book called Level Up Your Life that's fantastic. Mike and Rob wrote, or, uh, do the podcast Startups for the Rest of Us and have a, a community site called Founder Cafe. And Brennan Dunn, the site sounds slummy, it sounds awful, doubleyourfreelancing.com, but it's actually full of really, really good advice. So what we talked about inside here is what you have to do in order to get paid more, how you figure out how you're going to be known for doing it, how you've got to set aside parts of your calendar in order to do this blogging, presenting, webcasting, YouTube training, whatever, and then how you're going to go about getting people to start sending you jobs instead of you racing around in order to get good jobs. Out of everything that, oh, I should put up, you know, here's my evaluations, go rate me really bad so they don't bring me back, and now let's open the floor up for questions. So I'll call, yes. Oh, at what point did we invest in graphic design as part of our marketing strategy? Uh, in 2011, when Jeremiah, Kendra, and I, and Tim founded the site, Kendra actually drew the top of the site. She drew our original pictures, and she got really frustrated with all of us going, can you make me look skinnier? Can you put some sunglasses on me? So then we hired a graphic artist, Eric Larson. So I want to say it was 2012 that we hired somebody to go sketch out and do graphics design. To get somebody to do a really good theme from scratch, it's about 25 grand, $25,000. So what you want to do instead, and we've actually lost, the, we don't use the theme anymore, but we still use Eric's art. What you do is go to themeforest.net. Themeforest.net is where they have all kinds of uh, WordPress themes available. They're around 50 bucks for a good one, and you search for the terms responsive and retina. Responsive means it works well on a mobile device, and retina means it has even good images on high quality displays. Pass should shop here, come to think of it. Did I say that out loud? I think I did, yes. Next question, yes. Mm -hmm. No, no, so should you write a lot of stuff in advance? I'll tell people when they want to settle into a routine, put five blog posts together first and schedule them out once a week. You don't start the schedule until you've got the fifth one done. That's if you want to start disciplining yourself to write once a week, but that's hard. So you'll learn whether or not you want to do the five times a week. 
Other than that, don't write the one and be done with it because, as I jump way, I'm gonna jump way back in the deck, there's two phases to this. If you're only doing this for the jobs that you're applying for in phase one, the people who Google you don't care if you've got one blog post or 50. They just go, Google, oh my God, he's got a blog. Oh my God, it's got a post on it. And then all of a sudden you're at the top of the list. So don't worry about that at all. If you want to blog to build a consulting company and get more jobs, then you got to do the one a week thing. Next question, yes. Do I recommend uh, certifications? The best way to answer that is whenever we did hiring, I never asked any of our staff if they had certifications. I didn't ask about college degrees and I still, I don't ask and don't care. Because when you want to find someone who's truly good at it, often they don't take certifications because they're not great measurements. However, I'm a weird customer. Like I know that I'm unusual in terms of hiring manager. If you're going to go apply to a stranger, strangers want to see these stupid certifications that don't mean anything. So then you have to study for it. But as long as you're putting stuff out there to the blog, I would always tell people, I would rather have you blog and build a market presence instead, because then people come to you, they don't ask where you are, they don't ask what you know, they've seen what you know. I used to think that people would ask me, can you send me your staff's resume and I want to see their college degrees? Nobody asks. They're like, we really like your cartoons. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that works. <laughs> but yeah, so if you're going for strangers, you have to get certified. Next question. Yes. How do I manage stress? I drink a lot. <laughs> uh, that's not, in, not entirely true. Um, the, how do I handle stress? I have a very hardcore belief in the getting things done book. At a certain time, I need to step away. And at say 5, 5.30, whenever it is that I'm done for the day, I go watch the dumbest TV. I watch Project Runway. I watch Survivor. Because uh, a big thing in getting things done is understanding that you will always be behind for the rest of your life. You're never gonna catch up. There's no such thing as being current. You have to be at peace with that and walk away from the computer going, it's gonna be just as bad when you get back. When I'm a production DBA and I have a server down, obviously that's different. But if I have servers going down continuously, I should, well, Tara's not in here. I would tell a story there. But um, if you have servers going down continuously, it's time to find a better job. Yeah. Yes. Does it hurt you if you only blog once a year very infrequently? It doesn't hurt as long as you're going for phase one. If you're only going for phase one where you are applying for jobs, you have to go get your word out there. If you're, not, if you're on phase two, you have to have a blog out every week. If you want people, strangers, throwing work at you, you need a blog post a week. All right, yes? Is there a way to quantify it? Absolutely. So is there a way to quantify the work that I do? I used to use, I like to use Google Analytics. How many pages, how many views per page do I get over time? If it's not going up, I'm not going to see a return from that. But if I'm getting more and more people subscribe and more viewers, it will pay off. It's just a matter of time. Yes. Oh, how do I justify uh, my income versus the time I spend giving away? I'm always trying, this sounds so weird. This is why I like these kinds of questions. I try to raise my rate high enough that I can give more stuff away. If I could figure out a way to get 10 grand a day and then just work one day a week and spend the other four giving stuff away, I would do it. And right now it's just a balance of how much do I want in the checking account versus how much I want to give away. I have a huge laundry list of stuff I would love to do, but I just got to pay myself first. It's so frustrating. I have just this epic long task list of, then I want to do this, and I want to give this away, and all these things, but it's just, you got to be able to pay for it. Yes?
how much, in my experience, how much are vendors willing to pay people? Totally, 100%, they are looking for people to do it. This is like, for example, IDERA has their ACE program. They are looking for people who are willing to go present at different SQL Saturdays and say that they're an IDERA ACE. Redgate has their Friends of Redgate program. They're all looking for stuff like this, especially in this day and age with permission marketing, yes. What are things that I ask a company when I'm going to work for them? I have a blog post about this. I can't believe I haven't pulled up Ozarmy yet. Um, questions, ask, consulting, site, Ozarmy. Uh, so Ozar.me is my personal blog post. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff on here around consulting and uh, building a consulting site. That first one there, questions to ask before you take a consulting job. This is actually one of my favorite posts. So to zoom in a little, for me to keep up with the workload, what hours do you expect me to work? Do your employees typically work after hours and weekends? Will I be on call? And if so, will I be compensated? Are there a core set of hours that I must be online and in the office? What do your projects look like? You're hiring me for R. How much of a backlog do you have and work for that? If you started right now, how long would my calendar be booked for? What other skills do you desperately need? Will I be responsible for bringing in new clients? Just all kinds of stuff there. So this is questions to ask before taking a consulting job. You totally should ask those questions. It's too late now. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll tell you. <laughs> do you have a Slack channel should also be on there. All right, so we're at time, I think. I think I'm supposed to end right here. 10.30, that sounds about right. So what I'll do is I'll stop here. I will stay to do questions as long as you guys want. I'm gonna do questions just out in the hallway so that the next presenter can come out. Thanks everybody for hanging out with me this week and I hope you had a great time at pass. Thanks everybody. Thank you.